graduated from AUB from the School of Medicine. And later on, he completed his resident residency in obstetrics and gynecology at Georgetown University Hospital in Washington. He later followed that up by a fellowship in female pelvic medicine and reconstructive surgery at Cleveland Clinic in Ohio. Now, uh, Dr. Jalad currently occupies an assistant professor position in obstetrics, gynecology, and surgery at LU Medical Center. to you guys now for the next 45 minutes or so, during which please do communicate with him uh, using the Q&A or the chat box. And afterwards, obviously, like any other time, we put on 15 minutes of uh, questions and so on. So Dr. Jalad, would you like to have this virtual floor all to yourself? Hi, Robin. Thank you for the introduction. I will be opening my so camera. I can see Dr. Jalad is on screen with us. Yes. Can you see me? It's all yours. Okay, thank you. So I would like to thank you for uh, allowing me to talk today. It's a great pleasure to be here and uh, I can see online a lot of uh, colleagues, uh, patients, students, future obstetricians, and it's great to uh, get to talk to everybody today. So let's have this uh, a bit more interactive. I'll keep going and I can see the screen and see if people are asking me questions. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to uh, interrupt me by writing on the side. And if I can't, um, you know, if I can stop, I'll stop, read, and then interact with you. Um, as uh, all gynecologists, our number one fear is to have a C-section or an emergency delivery in the middle of a conference. And this is almost going to happen to me. So I have a patient in labor, but fortunately, the residents are holding the fort. I hope we won't need to interrupt this. So. The menopause, um, the, the, the period we're going to be talking about mostly today is the perimenopause and the menopause. You know, you're all tired of hearing the same thing, menopause, hot flashes. So we're going to approach this from a different angle, an angle that's usually not talked about very often. And that's unfortunate because we definitely need to cover that topic and women definitely um, are interested, seek help, and are undertreated when it comes to those problems. So the stage of, of menopause, usually prior to the age of 35 to 45, there's a high rate of estrogen in the body, and that level of estrogen keeps the cycle going appropriately. Towards the end of that period, so 35 to 45, the periods start lengthening. The period starts lengthening. That's due to a drop in estrogen. And then that's when we enter the phase of perimenopause. Some women hit it at 45, some at 50. Then once the last period occurs, it's usually around the age of 51, we enter the phase of menopause, followed by the last phase, which is the post-menopause. So some interesting facts, as you can see over here, on average, uh, 51 year of age is usually when a woman uh, usually has uh, hit menopause. And Usually we wait 12 months before we declare that officially this is menopause. And uh, around 50 million women in the US are affected by that. Now we don't have exact numbers in Lebanon, but I can assure you it's a high number, especially now that the population is aging more and more. Um, some women are lucky and are in perimenopause for a couple of weeks and months, but some women unfortunately can be in perimenopause for up to eight years. It's unusual, usually it's a bit less, less than that. Uh, the most common topic we always mention when we're talking about menopause is, as you all know, hot flashes. It's always about the hot flashes, hot flashes, hot flashes. And it, while this is a very important topic, I think women need to hear about other um, things than the hot flashes. So today we're going to cover very quickly hot flashes, but we're going to try to talk about different things that are also of interest and um, uh, hopefully, if you have any questions, we'll delve into um, other topics. So the simple Google search yields the following. What are the most common symptoms of menopause? You will get hot flashes, night sweats, irregular periods, and you will get mood swings, loss of libido, and weight gain. While those are common, those are not the only um, symptoms of menopause. Those symptoms usually 
appear around the age of 47, 50, 51, last couple months, and then go away, hopefully. Uh, the, the symptoms we don't talk about very often are, for example, insomnia. Some patients go through a very difficult time during this period and have very hard time um, going to sleep or go to sleep and then wake up suddenly at 3 a.m. and cannot go back um, to sleep. Another important topic is the topic of depression. Some people associate menopause with depression. Most patients will go through menopause without being depressed a single time. Sometimes they're even much better in their life during the menopause transition. So depression can be due to menopause, but most of the time it's not due to menopause. So we should make sure there's no underlying condition, like for example, thyroid issues, or an underlying condition uh, due to uh, family situation or a country going through difficulties like we are going through now in Lebanon or like the corona and COVID situation in the world because I know some people are watching us from uh, different places around the world today. So uh, this can affect patients negatively and worsens the menopause symptoms. Um, definitely sexual dysfunction is a big one. We don't address this enough. Uh, patients see their physician and we go through this topic without talking about the sexual dysfunction because in 20 to 30 minutes you have to do your exam, you have to see the patient, you have to talk about all the things. It's hard to just add at the end of the conversation, oh what about sexual dysfunction? This requires a proper 45 minute discussion and better not open that discussion if you're not ready to sit down and talk and really understand what the problem is. As you can see in the picture, there's a woman and there's a man. Sexual dysfunction is not just uh, what women go through in, during menopause. Men also have sexual dysfunction, mostly erectile dysfunction, and sometimes it can be very hard to treat, and um, a lot of times it's the source of the problem while the woman does not have any issue. Um, this slide is um, important because this slide shows what changes um, the woman goes through mostly at the vaginal area where you have the, I don't want to call it the healthy vagina because the other one is not an unhealthy vagina. I'm just going to call it the vagina up to the age of 45. Uh, the wall of the vagina is usually thicker and there's more lubrication that's present. As the woman ages, atrophy takes, um, um, starts you know, appearing and atrophy is just thinning of the wall and the elasticity decreases and there starts to become a bit more dryness. So this has generated the new discussion and uh, we coined a new syndrome called genitourinary syndrome of menopause. This is quite new, it's been around maybe four or five years now and it's a collection of symptoms and signs that are associated with decreased estrogen. So, Genital symptoms are one of the symptoms the woman can um, start uh, manifesting. Sexual symptoms, the other, and the last one is urinary symptoms. So for example, the patient might say, I have dryness, which is a genital symptom. I have discomfort and pain with intercourse, which is a sexual symptom. And I also have uh, recurrent urinary tract infection. This constellation of symptoms is what we now call the genital urinary syndrome of menopause. Extremely important to identify simply because we have very, very good treatment modalities. Women usually respond extremely well to those treatment modalities. Again, if anybody in the audience would like to ask a question, I think I can see the chat. If you ask the question, I'll see it and I would be very happy to answer um, your question. Over here, you can see that genital urinary syndrome of menopause mainly dryness, decreased desire, loss of lubrication, start appearing around the age of 45 and keep increasing up to around the age of 52, 55, and then they start uh, plateauing. Now, in purple, what you see here is the hot flashes. Hot flashes, they appear around the age of 50, peak for a couple of years or months, and then disappear. So while most of our talks and most of the medications are geared towards the hot flashes. Hot flashes are usually temporary while the atrophy, the symptoms of decreased lubrication, arousal, and desire 
those tend to increase and continue increasing up to the age of 60 and 70 and are not reversible unless we intervene. So given that everybody's also interested in the common symptoms, I will cover um, quickly the best way to treat hot flashes, night sweats, irregular periods, mood swings, loss of libido, and weight gain. The number one thing women want to hear of the first time they uh, come to clinic is, doctor, I want to have non-hormonal treatment. I'm not interested in hormones. I don't want to hear about hormones. I heard those are bad and dangerous. So it's extremely important to go through the treatment modalities one step at a time. We always start with non-hormonal treatment. So some things that women can try is, for example, lowering the room temperature, which sometimes helps, sometimes does not. There's a limit how much you can lower the temperature because either the partner, the husband, or the kids will start complaining that it's too cold, too hot, or there's any problem. Fans are usually good if there's moderate heat. Uh, definitely not going to work in Lebanon during the mid of uh, summer. And then dressing in layers actually helps a lot. Why? Because if it's too cold, you can dress up. If it's too hot, you can remove the layers without having to adjust the room temperature. Avoiding triggers. This is something usually the patient says, oh, now I already know if I have spicy food, alcohol, that's it, I'm done. So once they identify the uh, triggers, it's extremely important to uh, um, work on that uh, and avoid uh, using them. Uh, now, somebody wrote, if the husband has good sexual stamina, could that play a role in delaying menopause through psychological effect leading to hormonal effect? That's actually an excellent, excellent, excellent question. And the reason why it's an excellent question is because, uh, you know, when the saying, if you don't use it, you lose it, that actually applies to uh, dryness and atrophy. So I'm not sure if it's the sexual stamina of the husband that plays the role. Uh, what is more important is that the patient is satisfied and the patient continues to be psychologically satisfied. Because while men sometimes you know, desire more of a straightforward uh, you know, sexual relationship, women will require that, but also will need to be uh, satisfied at different levels. So we'll, we'll target this in a couple minutes when I'm going to be covering this uh, uh, topic. Uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, newer modality, absolutely important. And we usually recommend it for patients who have uh, hormonal problems going through menopause, but are showing signs of depression. The patients showing signs of depression, then cognitive behavioral therapy is a very good modality. Don't forget, this takes time and also requires a lot of money. So not all patients are willing to invest the, this amount of money and to wait a couple of weeks and months until they see uh, improvement. Hypnosis is newer. If somebody's interested, they can email me afterwards. I'll talk to them about it. And mindfulness training has emerged recently. A lot of different ways of going through mindfulness training, which are um, giving interesting results and uh, women have been using them more and more uh, often. One cannot cover uh, a topic of menopause without discussing the home remedies, because you, you're all going to hear your friend, mother, grandma say, oh yeah, take black cohosh, take omega-3, take calcium, take vitamin D, so many things that we're bombarded with, and we never know what really works and what does not work. So in brief, um, Phytoestrogens or isoflavins uh, uh, usually are encountered in those, um, you know, uh, home remedies. So, for example, soybean is rich in phytoestrogen isoflavin. So it acts like a natural estrogen replacement and can sometimes help. Now, I'm going to quickly go through what's dangerous and what you should reconsider and what does not work. So black cohosh, for example seems to help. However, black cohosh can be hepatotoxic. So hepatotoxic means it can cause toxicity to the liver. So taking it in large amount, large quantities can be dangerous. In addition, women who've had breast cancer can be affected by black cohosh. 
So never take black course without consulting with your doctor and making sure that they're aware of it. Things that don't really work. Now, if the patient tries them and it works, perfect. But if she asks me my opinion, and I want to be honest with her, I will say studies have not shown that acupuncture, primrose oil, um, tend to work. Those two do not really work. Now, um, if, if she's tried it and she's happy, perfect. But usually, um, it does not help. Uh, can uh, nutrition late the menopause period or ease it? Yeah, that's exactly what we're trying to discuss now. So um, usually delaying menopause is difficult to do through nutrition. However, a healthy diet, healthy habit, exercising, maintaining a good um, intake of vitamins will in general improve the health around the perimenopause area and have a very positive impact on uh, patients. So absolutely, nutrition and healthy um, diet is very important during this period. Now, the non-hormonal pharmacotherapy is sometimes more difficult to discuss with patients than the hormonal pharmacotherapy. And why? Just because SSRI and SNRI are depression medication. So if I tell the patient, oh, don't worry, we'll give you an SSRI or an SNRI by the name of Seroxat or FXO or different countries, different names, then they're going to Google it and they're going to see that this is a depression medication. Our goal is not to give it as a depression medication. Our goal is to give it to treat uh, menopause and some symptoms of menopause with the hot flashes and the mood swings. And it so happens that those medications and their side effects are pretty good uh, to help us deal with this. This is not for everyone. We do talk about it, and it's usually reserved for a subcategory of patients, which we're going to talk about in a couple minutes. Gabapentin, Brigabalin, also interesting medications. Those are not depression medication. We use them sometimes. This is solely for hot flashes. Clonidine also blocks some mechanism in the body that decreases those, those surges of heat that the woman feels and tend to be very helpful. Now the big, big discussion, hormonal replacement therapy. Most women, the second you talk about hormonal replacement therapy, they will say, no, 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 no. This causes breast cancer. This causes clots. I've heard, I've heard, I've heard. And they're not wrong. The reason why they say that is because in the 1990s, all women across US and Europe were on hormones. They considered this the magic remedy, and they put every single woman on hormonal replacement. The studies at the time used conjugated equine estrogen, which is a different type of estrogen than the one we use nowadays. And they also used very high doses and they gave it to women who were 60, 65 and with heart problems and all those things. So in 2000, studies have shown that actually this might cause some problem and increase the risk of clots and increase the risk of breast cancer. So suddenly from 2000, 2010, there was a stop in the use of hormones and uh, you know everybody started freaking out nowadays hormones have been extensively studied and we can give hormones to women at the low dose for a minimum or a maximum of five to ten years without any problem uh, there are some contraindications which we're not going to discuss now but the route of administration is extremely important we have the option to give them orally, which is by far the worst option. We can give them transdermally. Transdermally means by giving them with a spray or a gel over the skin. It can be administered through the vagina. And then the big question is, what are we giving? Estrogen, progesterone, both, a combination. Then it all depends on the, if the woman has a uterus or does not have a uterus and has undergone a hysterectomy or not. Uh, here in this picture, you can see pills. Nowadays, personally, I never use oral pills with hormones, estrogen and progesterone, just because the risk of clots and the risk of breast cancer is slightly higher because the absorption is much higher and the systemic effect is higher. Don't panic if you're a woman now and you're taking those medications. I'm not going to name the market uh, name for those medications. You are fine. However, there are better options out there that you could consider. Um, Livial or Tibulone, this is not available in the US. I'm not sure about Canada. I know some people are watching from Canada today. 
Um, Europe, absolutely available. Very common to use in uh, Europe. Um, Nivial and Chib or Tibulone is available in Lebanon, and this drug is wonderful. Like women who use this drug tend to uh, really appreciate the positive impact it has on their body. It uh, targets not only hot flashes and mood and um, vaginal atrophy, but it also targets uh, libido. And usually patients who are on it never want, want to stop it. And it's very, very difficult to um, convince them to stop it when they've hit 65 or 70. There is a slightly higher risk of clots, very low, but slightly higher risk with this medication. And maybe we're not sure, a slightly higher risk of breast cancer. But by slight, we, re we, we really mean extremely low number. Um, great question. Can a trauma or medical operation at the age of 45 precipitate menopause? Absolutely. A surgery at the age of 25 can precipitate menopause. If the woman undergoes a surgery and the ovaries are removed, then she can hit menopause immediately. That's uncommon. What's more common is women who undergo some form of surgery for endometriosis, which is painful menses, have their uterus or their ovaries removed, or if they had cancer, some form of ovarian cancer. And if they get it removed at the age of 35 or 37, then they've hit menopause at that age. Those women absolutely, absolutely need to be treated uh, at a young age. Uh, unfortunately, we tend to see them at the age of 50 and they've been without hormones for 15 years and that's extremely bad for their health, for their bones, and for everything that goes um, with it. Um, I saw the next question, is the loss of libido caused by psychological effect of, uh, or by hormonal dysfunction? Uh, I'm going to go over this in a couple of seconds. Now, over here, not trying to advertise uh, this medication, but in Lebanon, that's what's available. Uh, Estrogel or Estrodose is the gel that is uh, most commonly used nowadays around the world. It's a um, estrogen combination that's put twice a day, excuse me, uh, once a day, but two puffs on the arms or on the um, legs. And that also is paired with uh, micronitrate progesterone. Those are the closest to the natural um, estrogen and progesterone that you're going to see in the body. By using this combination with different dosages, we can have a woman continue to menstruate to the age of 50, 51, 52, or we can stop menstruation but maintain the benefit of um, you know, the positive impact of hormones on the mood, on libido, and on uh, hot flashes, so on and so forth. Uh, the, the loss of libido is multifactorial. This is why I said, uh, I'm answering the question now, you can't solve loss of libido during a normal annual well woman visit while seeing the gynecologist. You can't just cover all the topics in 30 minutes and then at the end, while at the door, say, oh, by the way, my libido is not the same. It, it needs proper evaluation, first and foremost, a good physical exam to make sure there's nothing anatomic that's going wrong. Second, try to understand the um, current situation in terms of family, partner, mood, kids, uh, financial situation, because everything comes into play and plays a big role in how the woman will feel during that period. I can't tell you how many times um, a woman discusses loss of libido, and at the end of the discussion, it ends up being actually the husband has an erectile problem, and she has absolutely no problem having orgasms on her own, but she can't reach climax when she, which she's with the husband. Now, the benefits and danger of hormone replacement, I talked about this very, very briefly. Um, I think this requires a completely different uh, session, but in brief, Low dose, short period of time, without major contraindications, is okay for uh, any woman to use hormone replacement uh, therapy. And most physicians nowadays um, are up to date on this subject and should be comfortable managing those uh, uh, medications. For how long would you rather treat with livial or hormonal combination? Usually, shortest duration at the lowest dose. 
if the woman is fine with Nivial from the age of 50 to 53, I can ask, would you like to try to stop it? And she stops it and she's still fine, then we stop. If she's not, we'll carry her to 55, even further to 57, 60. And needs change. While at 50, she might require it for a certain reason. At 57, she might require it for another reason. For example, if at 50, she's requiring it for libido, but at 57, she's requiring it for vaginal dryness, then there are other medications that are more appropriate than using something oral to treat a vaginal local problems. Uh, this uh, pink ribbon, unfortunately, is very familiar to everyone. The reason why I'm putting this here is because women who've had breast cancer or, or who have a very high risk of breast cancer, unfortunately, sometimes need to undergo a mastectomy and sometimes need to have the ovaries removed. Those women are extremely um, vulnerable because sometimes hormones have been withdrawn from their body at a young age and they cannot uh, get additional benefit from hormone replacement. So there are treatment modalities and those women need to be treated appropriately. We try to emphasize this and uh, um, hopefully in the coming slides, we'll see what are the options. The non-hormonal pharmacotherapy, which I discussed earlier, the SSRI, SNRI, gabapentin, pregabalin, clonidine, those are perfect for women who've had breast cancer. So don't let women, if you have friends who are suffering in silence, don't let them suffer in silence. Have them seek attention and take a medication that is not a hormone. This way they can treat those uh, symptoms that they're going through. As we discussed earlier, help the vagina that's thicker at the young age, that goes into atrophy and loss of elasticity and dryness at the later age, is the term we coin, uh, the newly term, coined term, genital urinary syndrome of menopause. Now, for this type of problem, the most important things are written here on the slide. If you want to memorize one thing from this talk, and that's something most of you can implement immediately today, is to avoid douching. Avoid douching means avoid putting water on the inside. Avoid soap on the inside. That's extremely hard to explain to a Lebanese woman. Why? Because Lebanese women are instructed at a very young age to clean, 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 and clean. The problem is uh, they clean with soap. If not soap, they say, no, don't worry. I have the pH neutral, pH 5, pH 7 thing. Not a good idea. And the last thing they say, use this for other things. If you use this soap on your hands, they're going to get so dry, you're going to need uh, uh, cream to hydrate your hands. And that's exactly what happens down there. If you use that soap in the intimate area, it will be dry. And within a couple of weeks, especially around menopause, when the estrogen is decreasing, uh, this soap is going to cause a lot of trouble. It's going to cause burning. It's going to cause recurrent infections. Yes, recurrent infections, because by killing the good bacteria, you're allowing the bad bacteria to go into the bladder area and cause um, those infections. No wipes. Same reason you don't use wipes extensively on babies, because those wipes have chemicals and very, uh, they irritate a lot. And try to use non-scented pads. The daily use of pad for women is not recommended. Pad during period, sure, but daily use of pad just because it's more clean or it's um, uh, they were convinced that they should do it is not a good um, uh, idea. Yes, I agree. The sabun bella they can bring peace to level to the Middle East. Absolutely. How about drying your vagina with a hair dryer? Uh, good question. Don't dry the vagina with the hair dryer. Uh, it will dry extensively and it will also affect lubrication. Just shower, normal shower, and at the end, uh, pad with a towel and that's it. Um, do not use a uh, hair dryer. Better avoid tight uh, underwear, especially if it's hot and moist in the summer. This way, uh, things can dry out on their own. Uh, the following items should be available in 
every household, especially when you have a woman who's above 50 and is sexually active. KY gel is what most people are familiar with. This is used at the time of intercourse. So at the time of intercourse, KY gel is a lubricant. It helps intercourse, it facilitates penetration and decreases pain. However, Replans or Vagigard in Lebanon or different brands is a vaginal moisturizer. So you need something like that. You go to the pharmacy and say, I need a moisturizer, not only a lubricant. Some are lubricants and moisturizers. The reason why this is important is because you apply it on a daily basis. And the same way there's, I'm sure, no woman in this panel today here does not use cream on her face at some point during the day. And most of you, especially now with the corona and cleaning the hands, use cream on the hands. However, almost no one uses a vaginal moisturizer. So extremely important to use a vaginal moisturizer that's applied daily after the shower, after you've dried the uh, vagina without the hair dryer, and to uh, keep it applied um, to, to decrease discomfort. This can also be applied prior to intercourse if you know you're going on a date. This can be applied and it will help afterwards with uh, intercourse. Can symptoms appear for a while, go away and reappear later? Yes, absolutely. The reason why they can appear, disappear and come back is one, because hormones go up and down. So especially around the age of 49, 50, 51, this can fluctuate. Now later on, 56, 7, 8, 9, usually no. Usually they appear and they get worse and worse and worse. Unless the woman uses moisturizers and other things we're going to discuss now, or unless the woman remains sexually active, um, and unless uh, there's something causing a surge in estrogen in that woman, which might indicate something bad. Um, as we said, the genital urinary syndrome of menopause is what we want to tackle and what we want to treat because this is absolutely. Now, I'm going to answer that in a second. Um, for women who desire something that will improve the vaginal discomfort or dryness, but do not want hormones, although vaginal hormones are completely safe, then they can use hyaluronic acid. Hyaluronic acid in Lebanon is available under different brands. That's one of the brands. In different countries, it's uh, probably another brand, uh, but it actually works extremely well. That's another option for women who had breast cancer and want to use something to minimize the dryness that they're complaining of. So let's go back to the question. You mentioned you're not, or not using a daily pad, but what do you do if you're always wet? Uh, that's a problem some women have, and I think uh, that that's better than being extremely dry. In those exceptional cases, then probably using a uh, pad is okay, especially if the woman is not complaining of any problem. But if she complains of problems, then I would say better change underwear three or four times or two times a day than wearing pads and, and um, struggle with it. Because some women are allergic to the uh, uh, scent that's put in the pads and end up developing redness around the area. If the woman is not sexually active, what women should use to avoid dryness and discomfort? Perfect timing. First and foremost, vaginal moisturizer. All my patients who are 70, 80, even 90 year old, I encourage them to use the moisturizers. Some of them are active, some of them are not, and most of them are very grateful that they're using the moisturizer. Of course, first no soap, then moisturizer. Uh, Ava Restore or hyaluronic acid is the second uh, best option that they could use. The third is a Vegifem or Estradiol. In Lebanon, we have it under tablet forms. In the US, Canada, and Europe, they have it under tablet forms and cream. Extremely uh, useful medication to have. This is used twice a week and can literally take back the uh, vaginal dryness or vaginal thickness uh, 10 years approximately. And this is the best medication a woman can use between the age of 50 and 70 to continue being sexually active without any problem. That being said, if the woman has breast cancer, they should discuss that with the oncologist and gynecologist because if her receptor was 
estrogen positive, then there are things that need to be uh, double checked before she uses them. Short of that, there's almost no contraindication to use them. Uh, in the US and Canada, unfortunately not in Lebanon, we now have on the market something called uh, Presterone. It's a vaginal insert, and this is DHEA. It's a precursor of estrogen, if you wish, and thought to have even less side effects than estrogen. And it's a very promising drug that's been currently used very common, very frequently uh, across the world. Hopefully, we'll get it in Lebanon in the coming months. Uh, Osfina, just talking about it very briefly, is an oral medication that is similar to um, what women take for a bone loss. Uh, it, it's a, it's a, I'm going to use a technical term for the doctors who are attending. It's a CERM, it's a modulator. However, it, they found by mistake that it actually improves the vaginal dryness and uh, improves um, a bit libido, and now it's being used and marketed across the world. Uh, for libido, if it's exclusively a libido problem, what works best is obviously a good discussion with the physician and trying to understand what's the reason, and also a sexual therapy where you're sex therapy where you're talking with a specialist, a psychologist, going through different um, you know strategies to improve um, uh, the couple's sex life is usually very very uh, uh, rewarding. Otherwise, in the U.S. market, again, there's a new drug called uh, ADI. It's flibanserin. That is the male equivalent of Viagra. Uh, while Viagra works extremely well because probably men are more mechanical, you take Viagra, you have an erection. It's straightforward. This is not as great as Viagra because it requires a bit more than just taking that pill and, you know, just magically feeling much better for a woman. But this definitely helps if the sole problem is a libido uh, problem. I cannot have such a talk without talking about vaginal rejuvenation therapies. All over uh, the world now, it's exploding. You have radio frequency, lasers, many, many, many different modalities that are emerging. While some of them are very promising, you should be aware of a lot of those modalities, especially if marketed in, um, you know, beauty salons or places that um, are, are not meant to deal with those issues. This is not just like going and doing laser for some excessive hair or doing some uh, peeling for your face. This is a bit more uh, complicated and um, sensitive. Here I'm showing a laser that is used to treat atrophy, which is dryness. And studies have shown very promising uh, results. However, those things can burn. So before considering using those things, make sure you're going to a reputable center that has experience with those. Another device that's a radio frequency, this is supposed to tighten the area down there. And not all women need to have the area down there tight. Some have the opposite. Some have dryness, and it's too tight and need the opposite. So again, don't go into those treatment modalities unless you've done your search appropriately. Uh, this is other things that you'll see on the market in Contilase, in Timilase, again, used sometimes for good reasons, sometimes for bad reasons, but uh, there is a role for those things um, when uh, the, the evaluation has been done appropriately. I kept this O shot um, at the bottom. This is something advertised that it will change a woman's life by injecting uh, different things around the uh, G spot, or the, the, there's the O shot and the G shot. Um, again, I'm going to keep it at this for now. Um, beware of such marketing. There's no such thing as a magical shot that will transform someone's uh, um, intimate life uh, overnight. Um, again, I'm showing the breast cancer uh, logo, and that's because women who've had breast cancer can benefit from laser therapies given that they don't usually uh, have the, ch the choice of using hormones. So this is a subset group that definitely would benefit from those laser therapies. Um, very briefly, I'm going to cover a quick um, overview on prolapse because some patients uh, sometimes 
have prolapse and that's the cause of their sexual dysfunction. So as you can see here, that's the bladder, the uterus, and the rectum. Prolapse is when the organs with age due to delivery or to ex genetics or extreme exercise causes a drop in those organs. Uh, sometimes the bladder alone can drop or sometimes the rectum alone can starts going down. Those things, if the woman is not bothered by them, are not bad. Most women at the age of 50, if they deliver two kids, have some form of prolapse. It is not something they need to worry about. However, if they do have prolapse and they're bothered by it, or they see it, or the partner sees it, or they say during intercourse, it's too loose, I don't feel anything, then we can address those, th those things with different modalities from physical therapy to surgery to lasers, so on and so forth. Uh, lastly, you can also have problems with incontinence. Over here, you can see the bladder with the normal ligaments around. And here you see the bladder with the ligaments which are torn and the woman starts leaking. And there are uh, different ways of repairing that and fixing the issue if a woman leaks urine while exercising or while uh, laughing. Um, why is this topic extremely challenging? Well, first, because of clinician time constraints. It's very hard for us to see 60 patients a day and at the same time address those things which require a special visit. So I urge you, if you're having an issue with one of those things, see your doctor and focus on that issue in particular. Don't talk about your hypertension, your cholesterol, your breast issue, and that problem. Focus on that. That's much more important uh, to differentiate the different topics. The buzz with bioidentical and alternatives is a problem. That's why you should only read reputable sources or ask your doctor for a reputable source and avoid Googling all those things. And the newer agents with the risks and benefits keep changing. So again, you need to consult with somebody who's up to date and knows what has changed and what's new on the market. And the different delivery mechanisms might be adapted to different types of problems and women. An 80-year-old might have a problem inserting a pill, might prefer a cream, and all those things. That's why uh, menopause, especially sexual dysfunction during menopause, needs individualized uh, treatment. Now, um, lastly, I would like to just say that living with menopause is not the end. It's actually uh, a new beginning. And a lot of women, uh, truly, that I see at the age of 55 and 60, uh, mentioned that this is truly a new beginning. So our goal as gynecologists, I think, is to make every woman feel uh, that. Um, I'm happy to take more questions. I know that we've covered some questions, but I think we still have a bit of time if anybody has any uh, other questions. Uh, Robin, let me know if there's any other thing um, or other questions that I've missed. Hi, Carl. Hi, everyone. Uh, please make sure you use the chat box. I know I think Carl is actually checking out his chat box. So should you have any questions, yeah, let us um, uh, continue over there. But uh, Carl will be able to answer all your questions by manually uh, 15 minutes or so. And uh, I think until you get your first question, Carl, I want to thank you for this uh, wonderful 45 minutes, to be honest. And uh, when I heard the topic was about menopause a little more personally for me this is not going to be of interest the background was one or two minutes in and i realized this is actually quite interesting and it gives everybody a few take-home points pertaining to how to ensure you know you maintain a healthy female reproductive system as well as a healthy healthy sexual lifestyle but then you can how much i got from this as well is that you were talking about there are medical uh, processes that one could actually go and um, acquire in order to ensure that they um, uh, maintain a healthy uh, productive system and the sexual life lifestyle that's how much you know my phone from people or organizations or mahalat that are not yeah. md or the right certified in man amerika and beauty salons in this particular case but in the meantime, I think I will leave you to your chat box, Carl, should you need to answer any. Uh, yes, I'm going to go back up and we're going to start answering those questions. Um, first, uh, thank you, Jihan, for your comment. Uh, correlation between hysterectomy and dryness. Does a hysterectomy make it worse? Over is still there. That's a great question. Um, when you have a hysterectomy, there is a slight decrease in estrogen and you hit menopause a bit earlier. 
So if the woman was supposed to hit menopause at 51 and she undergoes a hysterectomy, she might hit it at 50 and a half. Uh, that's number one. Number two, when you get a hysterectomy, you're leaving the top of the vagina loose. So this can cause some prolapse and women might feel less um, with intercourse. They might say intercourse still good. However, with penetration, I don't feel what I used to feel. That's because it's, it's not reattached in the proper way. And uh, uh, it can cause some uh, um, decreased sensation or decreased uh, feeling. Um, what is the probability of uh, getting pregnant during menopause? The probability is close to zero because once you hit menopause, you cannot get pregnant. However, you can undergo fertility treatment and through IVF, women can get pregnant. A 70 year old can get pregnant. However, that's not going to be with her own egg. So that's going to require a donor egg where a younger patient of the age of 20, 30 is donating her egg. We're mixing that with the sperm of the partner, re-implanting it in the patient and getting her pregnant. Is it ethical to have a 70-year-old get pregnant? I'm not going to answer that, but technically it's possible. Naturally, no, it's not possible. A vaginal moisturizer cannot cause a fungi, fungal infection, knowing the fungus thrives in most dark environments. Good question. What usually causes a fungal infection is excessive soap that kills the bacteria. By killing the bacteria, you are allowing the fungus to um, increase and it causes the imbalance. Uh, if a woman has no problem down there, she does not need to use a vaginal moisturizer. The vaginal moisturizer is exclusively reserved for women who are complaining of dryness at the age of 40, 45, 50, 60, 70. If they're not complaining, then better not use um, anything. Does menopause increase the risk of heart disease? The short answer is no, but women who are 50 have more chances of having heart disease than women who are 40, and women who are 60 have more chances of having heart disease than women who are 50. However, we used to recommend taking hormone replacement to decrease the heart problems. We don't do that anymore. We um, don't recommend taking hormones solely to decrease heart disease. However, a healthy diet, healthy lifestyle, and maintaining weight during the menopause transition should not increase the heart disease problems uh, immediately. Any special recommendations for a woman at the age of 45 years if no symptoms are observed? Uh, yes, uh, 44, if there are no symptoms, it's very important for the patient to maintain a healthy uh, lifestyle. Exercise, um, if, if she has a partner, having a healthy uh, you know, um, relationship with the partner. So if, if the relationship is dead and if there's no interaction and she has not had any um, satisfaction and she's not happy, then no, she probably needs to, needs to seek some help to transition during that phase. Other than that, if there starts to be a bit of dryness, avoid soap, use a moisturizer, and if there's a lot of dryness, then use some hyaluronic acid to maintain the vaginal uh, um, uh, flexibility, if you wish, or lax not, not laxity, the um, moisture that usually comes uh, at that age. By the age of 50, if she has problems, then for sure transition to uh, hormones. How about weight gain? Is it a common symptom to all? Unfortunately, with the lack of hormones, there's a bit of surge of uh, uh, fat that tends to set at around the age of 50. But women who exercise, maintain a healthy lifestyle, can maintain a very healthy body and a probably a good body image that they would be very satisfied uh, with if uh, that's what they require. Taking hormones solely to lose weight is usually not recommended, and women should make sure they don't have a thyroid issue that's causing the weight gain. Um, thank you. Okay, Lana. Lana is a gynecologist to be, so I look forward to interacting with her. Uh, thank you. Can I prevent hot flashes? Yes, preventing hot flashes is the topic of uh, what we discussed today. You need to work on layering, being in cooler environments, and also focusing on um, exercising. And if need be, then you introduce the non-hormonal treatment, the 
non-hormonal pharmacotherapy, and if need be, you introduce the hormones. So yes, hot flashes should not be a problem. There are many ways of treating that. Best postmenopausal uh, supplements. Um, you usually uh, having some vitamin E is good. Maintaining a good level of vitamin D is good. Um, every couple months or weeks, there's a new trend. There's the Ayurvedic trend. There's the um, local doctor trend. There's uh, different trends. I would say nothing has been proven to be of major benefit uh, except you know maintaining a healthy lifestyle and eating a balanced diet and exercising um, and um, just taking normal preventive measures. Um, have you heard the medication Cimefimine Fort and Premens from the company Zetter? Uh, they are herbal. Yes, yes, um, th there are many, many herbal medications. I haven't mentioned them. Um, one option is uh, Menovil, the other option is Menotia, different countries, different medication. The most important thing is to get the medication, show it to your doctor, have the doctor review it, because we don't really know what's in all the medications, but we know uh, if we do a search. So prepare the file, send it to the doctor, let him or her review the medication before you see your doctor. This way, once the doctor uh, reviews them, they can go over those and confirm whether or not it's a good medication. Um, I'm also very happy to answer if you want to send me an email and we'll talk about it. Uh, are moisturizing intimate cleansing cares bad? Moisturizing are good. Intimate cleansing, I don't want to name products. I don't want to, you know, to affect the, 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 the companies that use them. But anything that's marketed as intimate soap with neutral pH is not needed. Women do not need intimate soap with neutral pH. What they need is to leave the vagina alone and it will auto clean and cleanse. And if there's a smell, because that's a very common uh, problem that women state that's what they're using soap, it's because of the soap. Because the soap will kill the yeast, allow the bacteria to proliferate and cause an excess um, growth. Uh, how do we know if uh, spotting is abnormal in perimenopause? Spotting perimenopause is usually okay. Spotting in perimenopause if you're 54, 55 should be addressed. A quick ultrasound showing that there's no thickness in the uterus is more than enough. Uh, sudden bleeding after menopause, that should be always addressed. Do devices such as pelvitone work well in strengthening the pelvic floor muscle? Um, yes, this is the second line. The first line is to do the exercises without the pelvic tone. The second line is to use devices such as the pelvic tone. They're not for everyone. Some patients cannot tolerate doing those on a daily basis. Some patients adore them and love them. The most important thing is to get a proper evaluation to make sure that the degree of prolapse or laxity is not extreme so you don't waste your time on such uh, products. Is insomnia a symptom of menopause or is it because of the increase in age, which is also associated with less sleep or also maybe because of psychological changes? That's a very good question. It's the mix of everything. Now with what's happening um, around the world, and especially in Lebanon, I can assure you that patients are calling every day with insomnia, mood swings, uh, irregular period, and those symptoms are increasing tremendously. Why? Because of the um, current stress level, they are very high, and everything has changed. The diet has changed, the lifestyle has changed, and that's causing a lot of uh, dysfunction. So the answer is insomnia is a mix of everything. We can have a separate talk on insomnia and talk about ways to avoid it, especially preparing yourself to go to sleep and ways to avoid waking up in the middle of the night and not going back to sleep. But in brief, yeah, it's a mix of all those things together. What about the early onset of perimenopause? It needs to be treated until the average menopause age. Um, yes, thank you for this question. Absolutely. A woman who hits menopause at the age of 40 needs treatment. Otherwise, by the age of 50, she will be uh, in bad shape. She will need a lot of help, and that's, that's a close to a medical error to not treat a patient who goes into menopause at the age of 35 or 40. Those patients need to be treated at a very young age. Why do women put on weight at menopause? 
many reasons. One reason is just age. Second reason is hormones are decreasing, fat is setting in, and the metabolism slows down. However, I know women who've lost weight during menopause and perimenopause just by focusing on a very healthy, regular routine, exercise, diet, and of course the body is going to change. But the, the goal is to let it change in a way that will continue satisfying the uh, woman. Um, thank you. It's been more thank, thank you. Thank you. Question. What can I do to improve mood swings from uh, menopause? Again, to improve mood swings from menopause, it goes from uh, non-hormonal to non-hormonal pharmacotherapy to hormonal. If you've tried everything and nothing's working, then probably your best bet is uh, hormones. But before taking those, make sure you, may, you, 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 you are a good candidate for hormones. And um, depending on that, um, you, you, you should have that mood swing problem under control. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I've there's a class. Thank you. Thank you, Lamia, for the support from Canada. Okay, I think I've answered all the questions. Um, oh, are joint pains a common menopause symptoms? Can be. Yes, can be. We don't talk about those very often, but absolutely. Joint pain can be a common symptom of menopause, treated with exercise. And if it does not work, with uh, some hormonal replacement. Uh, what about CTL antiseptic? Uh, no woman needs an antiseptic in the intimate area. There's nothing dirty about that area, so no antiseptic for intimate uh, area. Okay, great. People saying thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think this covers it, Robin. Any other questions? Well, I think so too. Uh, Sorry, four, five, nine. So we've got one more minute or so. But I think. Thank you. Uh, well, first of all, I want to actually thank you, and we're all grateful here, myself and all the participants, and like Dr. Kurmana for this hour. No, just barely say our ago. He was, Carl was telling me he has a, a lovely young lady waiting for him to deliver a baby, if I'm not mistaken. So, an hour or so. And thank you for the. Uh, the information in the I was quite happy, and you received so many questions along the color line, and you were able to just provide heck, quick, sharp answers, which is kind of good rather than heck, uh, delaying in every single answer. But in the meantime, guys, um, if you have any further questions to uh, to call, please you can look up his email on the website, okay? And uh, like I've done with pretty much every participant so far, every presenter so far, I'm volunteering. Uh, uh, as efforts, if you guys have any any questions, so please hit them up with an email, and Carl will be able to reply to you. So sorry once again, sorry, sharp. We'll have to go, and don't forget tomorrow, guys. I'm a topic by Dr. Emil Manna, who is another colleague of uh, Carl as well, a physician at LUMC that is a hospital, and he's going to be talking about. Well, his, well, his title is simply "I want to live longer." What tests should my cardiologist order? And in the meantime, I'll leave you with the fact that. Helena Manon write about Sorbonne and Baldemish, she will be So, I wish my mom was actually here listening. I know my mom is one of those people always bragging about Sorbonne and Baldemish. So, finally, we have a physician, an MD, telling us it's about Manamaki, Halat, Al Sorbonne and Baldemish. We're just saying it's not going to bring peace to the Middle East, as we already mentioned. So, in the meantime, I'll leave you guys to wait. To Carl, thank you very much for a very informative session, which thank is not you. just about menopause, it's about uh, a healthy uh, reproductive system and sexual uh, lifestyle as well. So in the meantime, guys, yeah, enjoy your uh, afternoons, your evenings. The weather is quite nice. And we will see you tomorrow at 4, Khamis at 5, or Friday back at 4. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye, bye. Have a lovely evening, guys. Bye. Thank you.